It's time for the Georgia State Sports Update. Dave Cohen along with Harper LaBelle here at the Georgia Dome. Final score, Georgia State's won its third consecutive game, its fourth in its last six outings, beating Troy 31-21. And Harper, Georgia State jumping out early and uh, picking up a win. I mean, this, this team has really started to turn things around uh, since the game at Ball State. Yeah, the consistency that you're seeing on offense, especially today with the running game, 151 yards, awesome. And it allows the passing game to click even better after you see the running game start the way that it did. Nick Arbuckle with 368 yards in the air. He's been unstoppable the last couple of weeks. But three games in a row, Dave, that's pretty nice to be in. Well, it's not like we have to go out and rush for 200 yards. I mean, 150, 140, it's been sufficient with the nut kind of numbers that Nick has been putting up through the air. And again today, spreading around, throwing to five, six different receivers led by Keith Rucker and his 10 receptions. Yeah, that was incredible. Keith did a tremendous job near the end of the game both his shoulders seemed like he was hurting quite a bit that was something I think that will come into play here in the near future I hope he's able to heal from that but 10 receptions are you kidding 150 yards for him great job almost got himself in the end zone but uh, the other guys that were able to get the ball you've got Donovan Harden uh, uh, he had a nice game but really when you've got uh, Robert Davis and Penny Hart getting the ball in the end zone the, there are, there's a lot of talent that's able to get the ball where you need to downfield it's been great you know, we've talked so much about uh, everything that the offense has been able to do. A couple of things on the stat sheet, 10 of 18 on third down conversions. I don't want to say dominate, but definitely won the time of possession battle today. Uh, 38 minutes and 6 seconds. I mean, doing the little things. Not that third down conversions are little, because those are the things that keep drives going, but doing the things that we were struggling to do early in the season. Right, and penalties. Fewer penalties. Yeah. Uh, fewer turnovers. You had a few today. Uh, you've had a few in the past couple of weeks, but your ability to rebound from those, that's been a key factor right there. And the defense has played much better as well. Let's talk about the defense, though, with this team. The defense has really turned it up, especially during this last stretch of, other than the game at Arkansas State, where we gave up, what, 40-plus points, uh, even in the loss to Louisiana Lafayette, only surrendered 23. The defense has, for whatever reason, really turned it up a notch here. Jesse Minner has done something with this defense, has really turned it around. Well, running and being able to stop the run are keys of football. Being able to stop the past opponents that we've had, uh, key runners that have averaged over 100 yards a game or pretty close to that are getting about half that now. Uh, the guys up front are making a big difference. Coverage in the secondary, getting a hand up, deflecting the ball, interceptions, all the things that you would want, they're all seeming to come in one after another, they're happening, the steps are being taken. Uh, it, it's just nice to see our ability to get a three and out. Yeah. No penalties. You know, so things that used to be a problem on the Panthers defensively are now becoming a factor, and they're actually something, they're, they're a benefit that's taking place right now. And, you know, when you talk about stopping the run, it, it reminds me, you go back to the problems that the defense has had the last couple of seasons in our first run through the Sun Belt here. You go back this year, Elijah McGuire did not hurt us that much. Robert Lowe at Texas State did not hurt us, hurt us that much. The way they have in the past, Brandon Burks today ran okay, but didn't hurt us the way as a premier back in the Sun Belt, he's hurt us and they have hurt us, you know, the first two years in this league. Yeah, I completely agree. And then you throw in some of the quarterbacks, like Tyler Jones lit us up last year here in the Georgia Dome. We go out there to Texas State and we hold him to under 200 yards and we win the ball game. That's what good football is all about. We're starting to see the progression of the ability to just at one play at a time be able to win that play, win that series, win the quarter, and ultimately win the ball game. Another guy that's really stepped it up defensively, you know, we could talk all day about Joe Peterson, one of the 25 seniors on this football team. Uh, you could talk all day about Alonzo McGee, who leads with uh, tackles for loss and the, the aggressive play of Caleb Ringer. Shawanye Lawrence has really turned it up here the last three, four weeks. I mean, we've talked about Shawanye as being the young freshman he was, what, 17, 17 years old years when old. he got to Georgia State. Um, and he, he and Melvin King, especially in today's game, uh, here against Troy, played outstanding football, batting yeah. down two or three passes. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Melvin, because the two of them together on that side seemed to have whatever it was that needed to work to 
be able to put the pressure on Brandon Silver and get their hands up when he was going to throw. Three batted balls that we, we were able to count, there might have been a fourth in there, really changed the way that they wanted to throw to that side. The progression defensively, if you get a good pass rush, if you're able to put pressure on the quarterback, then your linebackers and your secondary, their job is much easier. Those things are all seeming to click right now. Again, 31-21, the final. You know you're having success moving the football when you continually throw. Now, again, again, Nick did a great job spreading the football around, but it's special when you're able to make 10 catches in a football game. And even late in the game when he was a little beaten up and battered, Rucker was still catching footballs. They simply couldn't deny him getting the football. And you can kind of say the same a little bit about Robert Davis. Uh, the way Robert Davis was able to get in there and make some big catches today. Well, Troy had really not much of an answer for, for shutting those guys down. Has Robert gone a game without <laughs> catching a pass? It's been unbelievable watching him from a freshman coming from Warner Robins and really not having all that much around him when he was in high school, didn't have a whole lot of catches. And now here he is as one of the premier receivers in the Sun Belt. Love to see it. But the distribution today was fantastic. And there aren't too many times where you're going to catch 10 passes. but. He'll get razzed in the locker room a little bit because he had a drop right there at the end of the ball game. But that's a good type of thing that you want. The family is coming together in a right way offensively. And Nick has multiple targets. If you guard my guys on the outside, I'll go to the inside. If you guard my guys on the inside, I can go to the outside. He, he's playing that chess match very well. All right, 31-21, the final score. Georgia State a winner at the Georgia Dome over Troy. Their fifth win of the season right now. With Nick Arbuckle's 368 yards and all those yards on the ground, let's take a look at some of the highlights of Georgia State's win over Troy. One twenty-one. the final score. Georgia State a winner over the Trojans of Troy. Joined in studio right now by Georgia State's head football coach Trent Miles. Third consecutive win. And uh, this team's rolling right now uh, into the final regular season game, which we got to go on the road down to face Georgia Southern, the in-state rival. We're, we're executing much better. Our, our, it's great to see our young men develop right before our eyes and their confidence continue to grow. But then this one will be a very tough game. They don't lose much at home. I think their seniors are like 29 and 2 and they've won 180 something games at home and only lost like 30 in their history so 
you know, we've got our work cut out for us, but uh, our kids are going to show up. I can guarantee you that. And uh, they'll be prepared and they'll be excited. And we've got a lot on the line, you know, and in just year number six, we're playing for a bowl game. And, uh, you know, it's a, that's a, a great accomp accomplishment for our young men and for our program. So we're very excited about it for not just us, but Georgia State family and Panther family and the administration and the student body and, and everybody. You know, the defense coach is playing really, really well, and it's like that time in between the loss to App State and the game at Ball State, something happened. The defense just all of a sudden, they say the light bulb went on, and this defense has been playing lights out. And we've never really had to worry much about the offense, per se, because the offense led well, We've by, had to worry about everything. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying, but we've, we've managed to score points. Even in yes. the games we were not fortunate enough to win, we were able to score points. Um, but the defense has really balanced it out now by playing as well as they have here recently. Well, what's happened is, they, they, you know, another year under the, under the belt in the system, uh, more depth, obviously more talent, and uh, player development. Young mm -hmm. men are, are getting better, and they understand the scheme. They understand the, the preparation it takes to execute it on Saturdays, and they're working and, and they're believing in everything that they're doing on and off the football field. So when you have that combination, you usually get better, and... We continue to, to do that each weekend, and we're going to have to continue to do that for every year. As you mentioned, Georgia Southern uh, down in Statesboro, a tough place, to, uh, tough place to get down and win football games for anybody that's had to go down there. Uh, practice uh, the week heading into this game. You're trying to keep it loose while at the same time stay to some semblance of the schedule that you have uh, kind of kept them on here uh, the entire season? We're not changing anything. You know, we, we won't change anything. We'll just do what we, we, we do what, what got us here. Right. And uh, it, it hasn't been wrong for our third season now. We haven't changed really anything other than we've, again, we've got more depth. We've got more scholarships. We've got, you know, uh, more development. We've got young men that, that are uh, uh, more athletic. So, you know, we, we keep, keep the, uh, stay the course, keep grinding away at what we do. Uh, obviously, there's different things you got to do because of their scheme on offense. Right. You know, that's not a typical deal that you see uh, every week. So, you know, we have to make adjustments there. But for the most part, our work schedule and what we do, towards the end of the year, we, we tend to cut back a little bit more workload. I mean, we don't want to wear them in the ground. You know, we want them fresh on Saturdays. And it's, it's what you get into late November, early December, you got to cut back a little bit. But uh, for the most part, our, our same format and same things that we do. You know, we've talked, uh, we're going to go to your questions uh, for Coach Miles here in just a moment, but I did want to bring up, because we've talked about Nick Arbuckle slinging the ball all over the field and, and multiple receivers, and we, we've talked about it, but how about Keith Rucker? Ten catches, 154 yards. That was an outstanding, outstanding performance by him. I am I'm thrilled for Keith and our team, but uh, I firm, I'm a firm believer that we have the best two tight ends in the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, Joel Ruiz, unfortunately, went uh, uh, unable to play this year, and Keith Rucker. And uh, they both are NFL-type players, and uh, Keith has another year after this year. He's one of those guys that we started as a true freshman, and uh, he's an outstanding individual, outstanding person, outstanding football player, and his uh, future is very, very bright. That was a career-best 10 catches, 154 yards, and Georgia State's win over Troy. Again, it's a big week. Georgia State at Georgia Southern on Saturday, and time now for questions for Coach Trent Miles. Whether or not a chase and the major is journalism. Got a question for you. When you and your coaches plan a strategy for a game, how much new stuff do you actually add to your playbook every week? Uh, what we'll do is we'll add a wrinkle here and there. Uh, we'll change a formation or a personnel group but run the same base core plays because uh, we can't really uh, make up a new system in just a few amount of days that we have to prep. We only get them 20 hours a week. Three of those hours has to count towards the game, so that's 17 hours of prep time, and that has to include meetings and weight room lifting, so you really don't have that much time on the field to invent and do new things. So we'll add a few things here and there, uh, change some things so they look different than what they really are, but they're really the same base plays, and uh, we'll go from there. My name is Abbas Arman, and I'm co-owner of Abri Coffee Room here in downtown. Coach, I have a quick question. How important is it for you to have players who can play multiple positions? That, that is a huge thing for us in recruiting. We always want to uh, recruit uh, what we call dual threat players, a young man that can play cornerback or receiver or running back, and we can move him around. If you've noticed most of our team, uh, you've seen a lot of that with our skill position, uh, whether it's a Shannon Sullivan that could play wide receiver, 
uh, safety or corner, or Glenn Smith that can play running back, DB, or wide receiver. So that's a huge thing for us in recruiting our skill position guys. Offense, or when it comes down to the offensive line, you like to recruit guys that are talented enough to play defensive line, but uh, if it doesn't work out, you can move them to offensive line. So yeah, that's a big thing for us in recruiting. Hey, Coach, I'm Amin Ra Mackey. I'm a senior here at Georgia State University, and I've got a question for you. So it's been a fun week of college rivalry games. Does playing Georgia Southern mean more to you than any other game, or is that more for the fans? Well, playing Georgia Southern means more to us because if we win, we're in a bowl game. Uh, yes, we want to have a rivalry. Uh, we have to uh, play well to, to make it a rivalry. We didn't play well enough last year to, for them to, to consider us a rival. So, you know, that's something we were, we're part of the process of building a, a program and starting traditions is playing well enough against an in-state uh, rival to, to make it a rivalry game. So I think that that's where it's going to grow to in the future. We have to show up and play well. But uh, we want to have rivalries with South Alabama and Troy and, and uh, Georgia Southern, anybody that's a regional game, especially for recruiting. But uh, this game is more important to us just because of the fact that it's the last game of the season, it's the biggest game of the week, and if we win, we get a chance to go to a bowl game. All right, Coach, let's get out of Statesboro, get us a win. Uh, good questions this week. Very good questions. Thank uh, you. Yeah, let's get out and uh, play well. Let's get a, bowl. Let's get a win and uh, keep playing. Yes, sir. All right, I want to thank uh, head coach Trent Miles joining us in studio. Georgia State, Georgia Southern coming up Saturday at 2 down at Paulson Stadium in Statesboro. We turn our attention out of basketball. Panthers under head coach Ron Hunter, 25 and 10 last year. A lot of excitement around the program heading into his fifth season, all based on the win in the NCAA tournament last year. Our Shamika Gibson looks back at the way the Panthers closed out the season last year. It was a loss to Xavier in the NCAAs, but the game before was R.J. Hunter's shot to beat Baylor. He misses! Shipes the rebound! You gotta push this to the basket. Take it to the basket, guys. It's nine seconds. No timeouts left. What are they doing? R.J. Hunter for three! Go! I was like, wow, man, what if this is like legit, like one of those crazy shots that you see for years and years on? Now, you know, it's just me laughing and joking inside my head, but like, it was just crazy. I was like, what if this really does happen? You know, you don't expect that, you don't expect to be there when something like that happens. We just started to lock in, we started to get stops. Uh, the crowd really gravitated towards us. It was almost like a home court advantage for us. I, I felt bad for Baylor in a way, but I was excited for us in a way because we really took over the stadium and it became a home game for us and our team really fed off of that. And I think the, the crowd was a huge part of our success that day. Well, during the Baylor game, the adversity, we kind of knew what happened. A lot of times when, you, when, you, when it's your first NCAA tournament game, uh, you know, you're just, you're a little rattled. The nerves, the, the environment, the TV cameras, the media, uh, the fans. I mean, it's for, for our program, that was, that, was, that was big and it was huge. So I knew the first four or five minutes that I was probably going to call a timeout to settle us down. Uh, I actually did not want us to get off to a great start because I thought what happens is when young teams get off to a great start, there's nowhere to go but down. And so I thought it was great that we had to work our way back up. Our fans were terrific. Our students were terrific. They kept encouraging and encouraging. And then when we hit that mountain and we got to the top, we peaked at the right time. Baylor was coming down when we were coming up. And so it was a perfect situation for us in that regard. And it worked out great for us. So at the start of the game, you didn't have a ton of fans in the building, but you could see it building and you see it building. And then obviously we got down by 12 um, with about three minutes to play. And, you know, the environment was kind of, it was, it was getting a little quieter. Um, you know, the people expected that at that point Baylor was going to win the game and, you know, move on and there'd be three more games in the rest of the day. But as the run started to evolve and RJ started hitting a couple shots and we made a couple steals and got a couple of defensive stops, the buzz started. And obviously we had a great Georgia State fan base that had traveled down for that first game. It was incredible pulling us on between the students, the alums, the fans. It was surreal. I mean, I'll never forget that. After the season ended and I like got the chance to soak it in, it was like it was really a memorable time for Georgia State basketball and Georgia State in our community because at one point in time, people here really didn't care for sports, and now you can see the culture change. When he made it, it wasn't really a surprise to me. Uh, I wasn't in disbelief, but I was excited for the guys because I just know. Uh, having played in the NCAA tournament, coached the NCAA tournament before, it's an unbelievable opportunity and something that you'll never forget for the rest of your life. You know, again, 
uh, just got to play through it, get our defense set. Uh, now Baylor ended up calling a timeout, so it really helped us get our, our, our uh, get established. And that's actually how I slipped because my mind was thinking about, you know, where's the ball? Because the official was blocking me out. I was looking at the ball, thinking about a timeout, thinking about not calling it and those type of things. And I forgot that I was on a stool that uh, tipped me over a little bit. Technically, I missed the shot because as soon as the ball like left his hands, I turned my back to the court and I like was bent over in a chair and then everybody started screaming. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. He made the shot. We're going to win. And then, yeah. So cool. And as soon as it goes in, it's, it's over with. I'm just, I don't even remember what happened. I just was everywhere. Like that's all I remember. I think I jumped on Dan and my face paint smeared all over it everywhere. Um, I was on the seat, like standing in the middle of the seat, just like cheering and all like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And it was just, I was everywhere. A time stops just for a second and you see this and it, it I, I can't, it felt like it went quiet in there. And as it goes, just this perfect arc straight into the, straight into the net and everything explodes. Just the, all the stands explode. Um, we, me and Nick, we're just running back and forth down this aisle. We're surrounded by people. We're just running, screaming like little, like little children. I think the shot is part of what has been many defining moments uh, for this program. Obviously, in our eyes, the program has been, been evolving a lot in the last few years. The shot and everything that RJ Hunter and Coach Hunter and the team was able to accomplish last year took it to another level, where it really made us not only just a regional team or a conference team, but put us on the national level. What a shot! Ron Hunter tipped over his stool after his son made a three to give Georgia State the lead. One of the biggest Georgia State athletic events in recent years and joined now in studio by the guy that was on the sideline across from the radio crew and uh, he fell out of the stool if you didn't see it as it happened live but joined in studio by Georgia State's head basketball coach Ron Hunter. And well, you talk about an event. That is an event for the ages and, and really a springboard uh, to everything that's happened. It was a very busy off uh, off season for you. And, of course, it places a lot of expectations, too, coming into year five for you. Yeah, it was a busy off season, and uh, it was very productive. And uh, last season ended in a... Uh, in a terrific way, except for, you know, people forget we still lost that last game. <laughs> I still wanted you, you know, it was only one team in the country that wins his last game of the year. But, uh, no, it was terrific, and we, 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 we enjoyed it, and we had a great summer, and now we're uh, ready to get going again. You know, I remember talking to you on the bus ride back. Team had stopped somewhere in South Georgia to eat, and we were, and you and I were just, we were waiting in line and kind of reminiscing. I said, Coach, now just realize, in the last two years, your basketball team's won 50 games. And for folks that have followed Georgia State basketball over the years, that is a huge, huge accomplishment. It just shows, you know, where this program is now that in two years you're winning, a, you're winning 25 games a year and winning a game in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, you know, we're very proud of that. I don't think people understand how difficult that is to do at this level. Uh, it's extremely hard to do and, 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 you know, to win 50 games in two years that way. But our kids have been very resilient. They've been great. Uh, they've been able to uh, uh, breed success. You know, that's one thing about our program. You know, we, you know, we've all, and as you know, we've found different ways to win basketball games and it always makes it fun and we've changed the culture of our program uh, when I got here that culture of course as you know wasn't here and so we've changed that culture of winning and uh, that, that, that's helped our program and it will help us this year also. Well you know they say winning breeds winning and you know you're, again you're coming off your second 25 win season I kind of call it life after the big four mm -hmm. uh, RJ first round draft pick your son of the Boston Celtics Ryan Harrell's playing over in Greece Curtis Washington has been in Hong Kong, Argentina, NBDL. Ryan Green, going to get his master's, going to work for the Georgia State Athletic Department. Point of all that is, is that at least in the long time that I've been at Georgia State, never has a coach have had, has to rebuild after losing three players who are continuing to play professional basketball post-Georgia State. You know, each team is a new year. Uh, you know, even last year, the start of last year, it took time for that team to gel together. Yeah. You know, you get teams and it takes time. you got to be able to figure it out. If you figure it out too early, the problem is you only have one place to go and that's generally down. And I've had teams like that. You start off great and then all of a sudden you get to February and you're, and you're not peaking and you're playing bad basketball. And so that's why I like this team. This, you know, we got a little, we got some veterans. Uh, we got a lot of new guys and trying to mix the, mix the two together is, uh, is, is giving me gray hairs right now. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, when they put it together, it's going to be really good. I really like this group because of what you just said. Well, you know, a couple of the new faces that you brought in, as you said, a really good blend. You've, uh, you know, it seems like the last few years have had one or two uh, high major transfers mm -hmm. sitting out waiting to join us. 
Uh, but now starting to see some high level freshmen mm -hmm. uh, coming right out of high school that you and your coaching staff have been able to bring in. So you got a Jeremy Hollowell on this end and you got a Malik Ben Levy over here on this end. Yeah, and, and that's what that was the plan all along. Uh, to be able to take the transfers and not do all transfers, be able to take high school kids, but not do all high school kids. No. Find that perfect blend. We've been able to do that. And so, you know, even with this class right here, we were able to do it. We got, you know, two really good high school players. We got two players, two scholarships left. We'll take two transfers. And that process has worked for us. You don't change something you've been very successful in, and that's what we'll continue to do. Well, the nice thing, too, is you go into uh, this season, and again, we're already early, mm -hmm. early into the season. You've got a nice little core group there with, um, uh, you know, with Kevin Ware and with, um, you know, uh, Marcus Kreider, um, as well as some of the new guys you brought in. So, you know, you yeah. did bring back a little bit of a core. This, this yeah. is a group that has been a part of what you have been mm -hmm. building the last three, four years and just been able to fill it in with some new faces. Yeah, when you take a look at a guy like TJ and you take Marcus and you take Isaiah Dennis, those guys have been around three years now and, Mar and some of those guys are going into the fourth year. Then you got Kevin Ware in his second year. You've got Jalen in his second year. So we've got some guys that, that have understand it. Jordan now in his second year. And then you add the talented people that we've got when you start talking about sitting out when you got Isaiah Williams and you got Jeremy Hollowell and then you add your freshmen and so uh, now you're just trying to blend all that together and you try to find a perfect mix and sometimes it's not perfect especially early yeah. and so you're going to you're going to have games where you kind of look like you know what's going on uh, but the funny part is we had a veteran group last year and this time last year I thought we won't win a game you know <laughs> so it just that's just part of it and, and you, you kind of keep grinding you keep getting better uh, but when you have a culture of winning that's what that's where we're at right now. You have a culture where this group knows how to win. They know how to win, and they'll continue to do that, and uh, they'll be ready when it's time to be ready, which is in January and February. All right, Panthers off to a 3-1 and one start. They've got Alabama-Birmingham. you got a road game at Wright State. Mm -hmm. I know you've you got a few of the Conference USA teams. Appreciate you coming in, and uh, looking forward to Georgia State basketball getting fired up again. Glad to be here. Let's, uh, let's go get our football win this weekend. That would be nice. So I want to thank head coach Ron Hunter coming in. He'll be with us starting every week uh, here on uh, This Week in Georgia State Sports. So that'll be coming up here as we move along during the winter months. Right now, busy time at Georgia State. Again, football, basketball, crossover. Let's take a look at what's coming up this week in Georgia State Athletics on the schedule. Coming up on Friday, December the 4th, men's basketball on the road. Going to take on Wright State up in Dayton, Ohio. That game will tip off at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. On Saturday, December 5, we'll be down at Paulson Stadium in Statesboro, Georgia. Head coach Trent Miles and the Georgia State football team going to take on their in-state rival, Georgia Southern. That'll kick off at 2. And then also on Saturday, December 5, women's basketball at home at the Georgia State Sports Arena hosting North Florida. That game will tip off at 2 as well. And that's what's going on this week in Georgia State Athletics. I want to thank head basketball coach Ron Hunter and head football coach Trent Miles for coming in studio and joining us this week. Busy time for Georgia State basketball and football. For the entire crew, I'm Dave Cohen. We'll see you next week right here on the Georgia State Sports Update.